Well, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, this morning. What a privilege to be here. Lord, Lord, my mind is just going 100 miles an hour here, so Lord, calm me down. Fine-tune me, Father, to give what you are giving. Lord, I just give you praise. Lord, we have no other agenda today. We want to do what you are doing. And Lord, I thank you. I need your help on this this morning. This is, this is something I've been looking forward to for quite a while. And Lord, I know that it's bigger than me. And Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing. Help me. Help me. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome in this place. Do what you want to do. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We've been talking about being known. And again, uh, this is, we've been working on this, working on this, and I still have yet to feel like I'm explaining it in any way, shape, or form correctly. Uh, I just don't feel like I'm getting it the way, I'm, and getting it across right, and getting it, I say, eh, I'm just kind of a problem for me. I see this as being incredibly deep, massive in practical application, and I just don't think we've gotten there. I don't know. I'll know when I find out, when we turn the corner and go, aha, then I know that we'll be right there. Okay, but so much about this being known. Today we're going to be talking about our destiny um, this is a, a big, big deal. Okay, our, li our beginning premise is being known. We gain much personal use out of our pain. We, it's amazing how much we need to tell our story, need to tell our narrative about what happened to us, about this, about the different things. It, it helps us v validate our existence in saying, look what we've been through. Okay. Only problem is, it really doesn't seem to be effective. We tell people and they don't care. <laughs> they don't seem to listen. It doesn't seem to affect them what we've been through. And yet we still have this need to tell them. And I'll bite, bite crack you. I'm going to tell you what I've been through if I have to just super glue you to the chair. You know? We use our past to prove our validity that we are valid, that we are able to exist, and that there's stuff. And so, and we keep trying to, to explain our pain, and yet we aren't doing it to get rid of our pain. We're doing it to explain our pain and justify our pain and justify being able to keep it. Okay? So our past is not doing us a whole lot of good. I mean, it's really messing with us. Okay? But we have this need to be known, a need to have our understanding of. This need to be known is, is really big. Or, in the process of needing to be known, we have found that every time we tried to be known, it hurt us. So now we're hiding from everybody. That also is not good. Okay? That's also not the idea. We need to be free from our past so we can go on. Who are you? Where is God calling you? What is it that he wants to use you for? And it's amazing that when we have our anchor in our past, we are not able to continue. Uh, and I, I'm hammering on this point. I just hammer on it. Um, all the pain and lies we believe about ourselves coming out of our past, and it's amazing how much we still believe about ourselves and think about, why do you do the things you do? Last week we talked a little bit about um, what is the atmosphere you carry what is the, the idea that you carry with you? When you walk up, what do people see? Do they see a victorious person? Do they see an injured little, poor little woodland animal just, you know? What do they see? What is the atmosphere, the attitude that comes off of you when you meet people? That is hard for us to see in ourselves. It is really hard to see. But when you look back and you think about the attitude people have towards you, why is it that everybody thinks that you're always hurting? Maybe that's the atmosphere you're coming across with. What things are we promoting? Okay, Do they see you as, well, I don't want to get too close to her because she's going to get offended. 
Is that the atmosphere that we give? Or I don't get to clean. She'll rip my head off. Yeah, you know, I don't get too close to. And she's just always angry. She's always, or he, doesn't matter. I'm just eh, throwing it out there. But it gets complicated when you start dealing with people's lives. You start dealing with other people, and things get a little complicated. That's what we're in this for. But we need to know that we are already known. We are already known. There was somebody who was standing there the whole time you're going through your pain. And it has been a constant thing for me, a constant thing to explain to people, because people go, well, where was God? Where was God when I was raped? Okay, probably the strongest, worst thing. Okay, where was God when all this happened? And I look at them and say, I don't understand your question. I say, where was God when all this pain happened? Well, he was standing right there watching. Why? And that just freaks people out. Well, they say, well, what do you mean you're standing there? Well, he's omnipresent. He's omnitemporal. He's omniscient. He knows it. What do you mean? Where was God? He was right there. And then the real question comes up. Then why didn't he do something about it? Why didn't he stop him? And that's the real question. The real question is, then why didn't God do something? Why didn't he protect me? Why didn't he defend me? Why didn't he stop that man from sinning? Well, I want you to look through Scripture, and you just go ahead and find for me anywhere you want. Go ahead and knock yourself out. Where in Scripture does God ever stop anybody from sinning? He allows everybody to sin. He allows it to sin. When did he ever stop you from sinning? Well, he didn't stop you. Why would he stop somebody else? He, that's not his job is to stop you from sinning. And that's why he gives us the command to stop sinning. Okay? You say, why did that person hurt me? Oh, because there's sin on the planet, that person was not listening to God in any way, shape, or form, and there's a real damage. You mean there was no hope? I didn't say that. There's a, always hope. There's a God of hope. What would have happened if you had cried out to God and brought God into the situation? What if you were the one that brought him open? What if your faith was the one that actually did something in that situation? And I've talked to so many women who are in the middle of being very in a very dangerous situation said, oh, God, help me. And they were not raped. They were not mugged. They were not molested. They were not anything. What happened? Oh, God, help me. And the situation changes. I talked to a woman lately that was sitting there, and she heard noises. Women do that. They hear noises. They do not know how to identify those noises. In their mind's eye, there's a whole crowd of bad villains trying to break in the house to kill everybody. Okay? And it's all just the cat tipped over something, and it's just like, wow. Okay, women hear noises, and the mind goes, we're all going to die. They freak out. Okay? And you're sitting there saying, well, where's God? He's right here. What can I do about it? Now, that's a whole other issue. Stop for a second and cry out to Jesus. Ask, Lord, what's going on? Lord, what is happening? Lord, protect me. You say, well, what if there were three bad guys trying to break in your house to do all sorts of mischief? And you cry out to God. What can he do? Is he going to stop those guys from sinning? No, they made the choice to do the sinning. Okay? They're coming in. Except, all of a sudden, a cop shows up out of nowhere. Or just an ambulance goes by with a siren going. He's got to go, ah, they all run. Neighbor pulls in and keeps his headlights on. And everybody's, <laughs> they all scurry like cockroaches. Something happens. What? God knows how to help. Knows how to maintain. I just absolutely love some of the stories about people who cried out and the perpetrator got so confused he couldn't remember what he was doing. I love it. We are already known. Physical realm, spiritual realm, Jesus is Lord. Amen. You mean he can change the physics of this realm? Yes. Why do we not trust him? We've been, for the last two weeks, last week and the week before, we've been in Romans. Hey, 
chapter 6, double A. Well, I like Romans, chapter 6. Verses 3 and 4 said, Or are you ignorant that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. Ignorance of what is true in the spirit realm is what kills us. We just don't understand. Well, the issue is this is not water baptism. This has never been about water baptism. Even when we preached it, that it was about water baptism when I was a Baptist. This was the main, 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 main passage when we started talking about water baptism. This is where everybody went. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about being immersed into Jesus' death, being immersed into Jesus' burial, being immersed into Jesus' resurrection. And the water. Water was a symbol of all this that happened. And this comes later. This is big, being immersed into Jesus' death in his burial, in his resurrection, being united in such a way that as Jesus was coming out of the tomb, all the resurrection power that he had coming out of the tomb is the same resurrection power I have in my spirit that raises me from the dead and brings me into salvation and makes me a born-again believer. Oh. Boom! Same thing. Oh. If that doesn't fry your circuits, nothing will. Just like I'm still trying to wrap my head around that because I know there's more there than I can grasp. We are raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so we should walk in newness of life. Not in oldness of my story. Not in oldness of the pain and damage from my story. Not in all the things I'm trying to squeeze out of it to make others understand about my story. Nothing about my past, but everything's been united with Jesus. I'm dead to my old man. Dead and raised from the dead. To do what? To walk a new life. Why am I still trying to get people to listen to my old life? See, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make a lick of sense. Are you set free or not? Are you born again or not? Are you a brand new Christian? Have you died with Christ or not? How many scriptures do we have to need to go over about the death of how we're united with Jesus? For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. How, does that make sense? You died. Okay. This is one of the reasons why I don't know if I'm getting, if I'm explaining this right because it's such a deep concept. It's such a wild thing. Wow. Wow in newness of life. Now I'm walking at, it's, it's just like that. I'm walking in all the stuff. I died. <laughs> life comes into me, I get raised from the dead. No stuff. No, yeah. mm, I could walk in a newness of life. Amen. It's that graphically simple. Then we got into Romans 9, 6, 19 through 21. It says, I speak as a man on account of the weakness of your flesh. <laughs> I always felt that Paul was writing that directly to Lee Eddy. I'm writing on this because I wish I could explain this to you, but the weakness of your flesh has just made it so it's really tough. Ugh, thank you. I speak as a man on account of the weakness of your flesh, for as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and to lawless act and to lawless act, so now yield your members as slaves to righteousness unto sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free as... To to righteousness. Therefore, what fruit did you have of the things over which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The big issue of this passage is he was talking about this is the way it was, and then he says, so now. Difference. I, I get this. I'm starting to really understand. The difference between my past and my present. My present was in such a way that I had lawless act unto lawless act unto junk and crud unto stupidity and to infamy of absolute defilement, everything you could possibly imagine. That was the way I was heading down. Anybody relate? Amen. Now, so now, so now shows a demarcation. There was that, and now there's this. So now you go from one level to the next level of unto sanctification. Whoa, yield your members as slaves. Let's go, let's do this. You used to know what it's like to go the downhill slide into stupidity. Now let's do the uphill climb into glory. Wow, this is, this is what's offered to the Christian. No Christian could walk around, walk around in defeat and unbelief. No Christian should. It's been all given to us. All given to us. 
applying our salvation, <sighs> being united with Jesus, one with him. We died in his death, true dead. We were buried with him. That's how dead we were. You don't bury live things. Well, you can, but they won't be live things long. We're buried, proof of our death. And then we were in his resurrection. Well, you can't give resurrection to something still alive. New. How cool. We've been raised to walk in a newness of life. My life is not to be lived in the past. Okay? We went over to the Jones' house last night, and I'm sharing a little bit of my past last night. A little bit of what did we go through? How did I think? What was going on in the, the very strange mind of Lietti back in the, in the day of all the junk and crud? Twisted, stupid stuff, weirdnesses to the max. How in the world I ever survived it is a total miracle of God. But the other thing is, I understand it, but I don't hardly even remember it anymore. That's not who I am. That's who I was. The change is so miraculous. Okay. I can't even begin to tell you. I'm a slave to righteousness now. My body is a weapon for that righteousness. All my members are weapons set free from my past to be who I really am, focusing on him and moving on. Focusing on him and moving on. Just as it worked getting deeper in sin and bondage, so now we're getting higher into righteousness. The more we find our past that isn't of God, the more we find the stuff in our past that isn't of God and submit that to him for exchange of what is true, then the more gain he has for us. The more I examine my life and find out what was stupid and then give it to him, the more he can take that and make me into something usable. Amen. As long as I'm wrapped up still in the stupid... He can't use me for the glory. i got to get out of the stupid to get moving. Anybody relating to this? This is all review, remember? This is review. Okay. The difference between then and now. Huge. So that since he has done it all, now we can walk differently. People say, well, I need to climb out of this. Pull myself up by my own bootstraps. By the way, that doesn't work. If you ever want to try that, I'll let you use my boots and see how high you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Those are there to put your boots on, not for transportation. We can be victorious and not be defeated. How cool is that? Set free to walk in everlasting life. It's a gift. Living in the gift of God. Everlasting resurrection life. That's where we stopped with it last week. Not bad, huh? How many know what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is? The love chapter. The love chapter. It is. The love chapter. Known as the love chapter for as long as I can remember. I'm going to completely ignore the first three verses that talk about if we don't have love, we have a problem. I'm going to completely ignore the next few verses which describes how love functions. I'm going to ignore it completely. I'm not even going to touch it. Because if I start down that path, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's waiting to happen. But, it's a, but I had to get to this because it is this passage that got me started on this subject in the beginning. I went through the whole thing on revelation knowledge and the whole thing of being known to bring us to this passage because this is what started it. We're going to start in verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 8. This is interesting, and it starts off saying, love never fails. Now, what that means in the Greek is really interesting. Because what that means in the Greek is that love never fails. I just want to make sure you knew that shade and that nuance of difference for the revelation knowledge for your own use is you can't change this. This is as simple as it gets. Love never fails. Well, have fun with that. But if there are prophecies, they will be caused to cease. If tongues, they shall cease. If knowledge, it will be caused to cease. 
Okay, now just for those of you who'd like to hit my little Greek words, okay, hit my study, this is kind of fascinating. If there are prophecies, they will be caused to be made idle. If tongues, they will stop. If knowledge, it will be caused to be made idle. Okay? I think this is kind of kind of interesting. Okay? Some are there, and they're there, but they're not needed. Others are just going to plain flat stop. And others are there, but uh, it doesn't matter. Made idle. Come on, that's fun. Yeah. That's fun. Okay? Not that it has any bearing much on... Right, we do talk about that a little bit. It says, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that perfect thing comes, then that which is in part will be caused to cease. Now, when I was in my growing up years, and people started to bring up tongues, people always said in the theology that tongues are no more. They are no longer needed. They were for the day back then, but they are no longer part of our society now because, and they bring this up, because tongues are to cease. Stop. We don't need them anymore. And the reason they bring that up, it says, for when the perfect thing comes. And they said, Jesus came. He was the perfect thing. Now, it's kind of a problem because Jesus came before tongues showed up. So that doesn't quite fit it. So people say, oh, well, that means it's the Bible. Yeah, See, the Bible is perfect, so when the Bible showed up, we don't need tongues anymore. In the original translation. <laughs> now, that's in the original translation. <laughs> hey, guys, uh, no. Do we still have need of tongues? Well, yeah, it's right there in 1 Corinthians. In fact, it's the next chapter, 14, and the one before it, 12. They both talk about it in minute detail and talk about its value. Are tongues still for today? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The one that gets me is when they say, oh, see, it's all to cease. And so we don't prophesy anymore, and we don't have tongues anymore. So the first thing I ask them is, so do we have any knowledge? Look at the list. Prophecies, tongues, and knowledge are all to cease. If one ceased, they all did. Do we have knowledge? Do we still need knowledge? <laughs> yeah. Are we still using knowledge and working on knowledge? Yes. Therefore, we need prophecies and we need tongues. Okay? This hasn't come to the perfect has come. What in the world is the perfect? What is it talking about when that perfect thing comes? There will be a time when Jesus Christ himself will be living on this planet, reigning out of Jerusalem, sitting on a throne physically, ruling this earth for 1,000 years. Will we need to prophesy to each other what God is trying to tell someone? No. He's going to be right there. It's going to be made idle. Why should we prophesy when Jesus is right there? Will we have tongues? No, they're going to stop. Why? Okay, think about this. Here, let's just say me. 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 Okay. <laughs> Come on, you had the shot, man. Come on. Okay, here I am, and I am going through the tribulation. Really cool. I get killed. It's a, it's a, it's a very grave possibility. <laughs> And what happens then? Well, during the tribulation, those who are died in the tribulation are going to come back with Jesus when he comes to set up his millennial reign. Amen. Okay, so I will be coming back with Jesus, very possibly on a horse, which is going to be cool. A heavenly horse. I haven't figured all that out yet, okay? Anyway, because they fly. You got to understand their... It's, anyway, before I get just distracted on that... I come back with Jesus. Who am I? Well, I am a person who has a glorified body. I have a heavenly body. has no blood in it. It has glory pumping all the way through it. Now, that's pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. There's no sin in me. None. All the sin has been eradicated when I died. So what do I have? I'm a sinless, glorified being with perfect connection of the Holy Spirit still living in me. What good is tongues going to do? See, I already have perfect connection to the one sitting on the throne. Do I need tongues at that time? What about knowledge? Well, this is gnosis, not epigenosis. This is gnosis. 
our ability to know stuff and think we're so smart is just going to be made idle. Have we covered that now? Can I go on? That makes sense. We're going to have prophecies and tongues and knowledge right up until the time we're all dead. But then it says, for we know in part, yeah, Maros, a measure, a little bit. We know in part. We know a little bit. Has that struck you yet that you only know a little bit? The more I know, the more I know I don't know. I know in part. I wish I knew more than I know. And I'm working hard at learning more about what I don't know. Because I don't know what I want to know. I don't know enough. Cool, but I want to know what he wants me to know. I can waste a lot of time studying things that doesn't matter. I want to know what he knows. But we know in part, and we prophesy in part, and that is absolutely true. Have you ever had a prophecy that made absolutely no sense to you whatsoever? And you put it on a shelf, and it is still sitting there rotting, doing nothing. We prophesy in part. Folks, it's not a perfect science. Prophecy is tricky at best. Okay? It's good. It has really helped me a lot, but... We prophesy in part. But when the perfect thing comes in that which is in part will be caused to cease. Okay? It's not all that. It's going to be better. Okay? That's really cool. Degrees of connection. We have certain degrees of connection with the Lord, and it's good, but it's going to get a whole bunch better. Now we are limited, but there will be a time when we're not limited to have opening to everything. Have a body that cannot die. And yet you can still eat. And you don't have to worry about it. You can transport. Phase in and out. Phase in and out of the spirit realm. You want to go to New York? Hi, New York. Come on, this is going to be good, right? Jared and I already have a list of things we're going to be doing with our glorified bodies once we get a hold of them. Okay, we got, we got, we've been talking about this for a long time. Okay, unlimited. How cool to be that, and here with Christ, reigning on this planet with people who are just normal humans. They still have sin in them. They still have blood in them. Normal humans. Occupying on a planet with glorified beings on the planet with Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. That's going to be good. And even nature itself has changed. Lions eating with oxen. Babies playing in the adder's den, playing with the, the snakes. Go, 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 go. Baby, rattle. <laughs> it's going to work. Just, the focus is on the new, though, not on the old. Notice how this works. The focus is on the new. All of this is focusing on what is going to be. Focusing on the new. Don't worry about the old. I think that is awesome. Well, then it goes into verse 11. It says, when I was an infant, I spoke as an infant. See, told you, see, it was just an illustration. Okay. I spoke as an infant. I thought as an infant. I reasoned as an infant. But when I became a man, I caused to cease the things of the infant. So many times I want to tell people in my office, would you just grow up? You act like we're in junior high. He didn't do this. And what she told me, and what he went to, and he went to Johar. Are you guys eight? Good grief, grow up. It's just amazing how much we want what we want. We're going to have a little tantrum to have it. <laughs> Shut up. Parents, have you ever gotten to that point? Shut up. <laughs> I, I said, oh, not another word, but I don't want another word. That's a word. I don't want a word. No words. Quiet. I feel the Lord is like that to us so many times. But you just, everything coming out of your face is doubt and unbelief. Would you quit it? Just shut up. There comes a time when you have to grow up. Okay? When we grow up, we stop doing the things of the infant. All of this petty, well, nobody knows my pain. Yes, somebody does know your pain. 
But trying to get another human to know your pain so you think it will go away will not work. Has never worked. Will not work again. What are we going to do? Man, we've got to know that he saved us for a reason. He changed us for a reason. Who are you? Saved. Changed. Spirit of God living within you access to the entire spirit realm, every single blessing that God has ever spoken is on you and spoken on you and yours for accessibility in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You have absolutely everything, everything pertaining to life and godliness and the revelation and knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. We've been given absolutely everything and whining, I want this and I want this and I want this. And I, I am amazed on how much we sit there and we talk to Christians and all they have to say is, well, I want this and I want this and I want this. Have you stopped long enough to ask Jesus what he wanted? Because if you're a slave of righteousness, like we just covered in Romans chapter 6, you're a slave. You have no rights and no opinion. We can expect certain things as a child. I just, I, I love looking at babies, and mothers don't appreciate this. When you walk up, and they're holding this baby, and say, oh, what a lovely little flesh creature. Yeah. <laughs> mothers don't like that. But that's all they are. It's all about them. Babies have no concern about anybody else. They just want what they want. I want food. I'm tired. I got stuff in my pants. <laughs> And I want things different right now. And it's a, it's, you, they rule. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, but after a while, it's, it's not normal to have somebody that's 21 years old and still wearing diapers. That's a problem. That's a problem. It does happen. It does happen, but that's a problem. That's a special needs. That is the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to grow up. It's supposed to get house trained. I mean, potty trained. House trained is for dogs. Hey, nuances. Um, yeah. They're supposed to grow up. There comes a time, and I don't know how many times I've explained this in the last month. On a scale, parental, parental responsibility, child responsibility. When they're born, the child has no responsibility, and the parent has 100%. But as this kid starts growing, they start gaining more responsibility and the parent starts getting less responsibility. And pretty soon it comes to the point where they meet and the parent has no more responsibility in that child's life and that child has all the responsibility. Hallelujah. Okay? All. <laughs> all the responsibility. It's no longer on that parent. There comes a time when that is done. You're done. Okay? In our society, it's the day they're supposed to be graduating from high school. That's when that's over. In olden times, it was around 13. Their bar mitzvah took them out of childhood. They are now responsible as an adult. But we need to grow up sometime. Folks, everybody needs to grow up. Can we grow up spiritually? Yes. We need to. Yes. When are we going to quit doing stuff like just choosing to sin. Brilliant, isn't it? Amen. No, it's not. It's just a, it is amazing that I have to sit there and talk to people and explain to them that adultery is sin. When I have to explain to a Christian that adultery is sin, I'm missing something here. They're missing something here. I missed. I just missed. Anyway, no, you just, whoa, ho, no, don't go there. Okay, focusing on the past is not maturity. Amen. Okay, that's a big sentence right there. When all we do is focus on our past and how we feel, what we've done, what this, and then, and then, and then, that's not maturity. What do you know? Remember, we did a whole series on maturity. What is spiritual maturity? And that's being the adult in the room. That's the one taking responsibility for touching others and taking care of others and being there for others. How will they know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another? It's having lust for ourselves that proves our immaturity. Ouch. Lust is immaturity. Love is maturity. It's the way it breaks down. We have a responsibility as Christians to walk this. Okay? 
You can't walk it as long as your past has a hold. So we have to actually go into that past and get that thing to not have a hold. We've got to get those things straightened out. Kind of interesting. It was good for a time, and then I grew up. So funny. For years and years, I kept waiting for my parents to show up. I'm married for 10 years. I'm still waiting for my parents to show up and take care of things. Yeah, didn't work. It's the same thing in the Christian walk. How many Christians do you know are waiting for the pastor to do something or some other Christian to do it or some, okay, when you find somebody that has a problem, you go try to run around and see if you can find a Christian to help this person. Oh, no, this is the norm. That's the norm. Whereas you are the one called to help them. Why? Because you're the mature one. You're supposed to be. You're the adult in the room. Okay, there it was. That was all the preliminary you're going to get. This is the verse. Here we are. Right here. Focused on everything. We have arrived. We have arrived. For now we see through a mirror in dimness, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will fully know, even as I also was fully known. Okay, let me break this down for us just a little bit. Okay, number one, Corinth, that these guys were in, the Corinthians lived in Corinth, was known for several things. One of the things they were known for is making mirrors. They were known a Corinthian mirror was the best you could get. They were not made of glass. They were made of bronze. They were, they were tried, they, they hammered them out. They did whatever they could. They tried to make them as smooth and as polished as they could possibly get and put them in a frame or sometimes built their own frame around them in bronze, whatever, and you had a mirror. It was wavy. It, it's really hard to, in, in their kinds of styles of workmanship for them to get a mirror that actually you could see yourself was really kind of unique. Okay? People were amazed. Sometimes they'd see their reflection in a pool of water and be amazed at what they've seen because they'd never seen themselves without distortion. Okay. For now we see in a mirror in dimness. Now, everybody's translation will say that different. We see in a mirror in obscurity. We see in a mirror. What's yours say? Dimly. Dimly. Okay. This is a word that we have our English word taken right from the Greek word. And our English word taken right from the Greek word is enigma. We now see through a mirror in a mystery. In a puzzle. We're now we're trying to see who we are in this reflection and everything is kind of twisted and weird. We're not seeing who we really are. Okay? Remember in in uh, first Corinthians, chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3, where it talks about if I can just get rid of the veil... I can see, and I can see the glory of the Lord in that mirror. Well, the, the hardness of heart is what makes that obscurity worse. It's what makes the enigma worse, trying to find all this, trying to find out who I am in this mystery of what's going on. If I can just get rid of the hardness of heart, I can start to see who I really am better. I can see, it'll take away some of the obscurity of this mirror, and I can see who I really am. Who are you? Well, for now, we see in a mirror in, in, in a mystery... But then, prosopon, pros, prosopon. I love the way it says that. Face toward face. Face toward pros shows action towards something. Prosopon, the part of you that is forward, the forward part of you, your face. I'm prosopon towards his face. His, who he is, is closer to me, and my face, who I am, is closer to him, and we're going now, prosopon, pros, prosopon, and he's seeking my face, and I'm seeking his face. Now we're looking through a mirror in obscurity, but there will be a time when I will see him face to face. Absolute nothing between my soul and the Savior. Okay. 
He says, for now, I know gnosko in maros, in a measure. Now I know a little. Now I know a little. But then, I will epigonosko, even as I am epigonoskoed. If there's any way of completely butchering the Greek and the English at the same time, I did it. But it still made sense. I have the need to get revelation knowledge of who he is and I, how much do I want it? I want it to be to the point so much that I have absolutely matched his revelation knowledge of me. Close relationship and growing. Limited interaction and response, but I will gain more revelation as I grow in him because that's why we did the whole thing on revelation knowledge. What do we do? We can grow in it. We can gain it. He's given us everything for life and godliness in it. The epigenosis is absolutely everything. We've got to grow in that. But the one piece of revelation knowledge that we haven't been growing in is to find out who we are. I need revelation of who I am. Now, I'm going to just pick on Trey because he's so pickable. Okay. <laughs> you are dog stupid. You are the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Anybody that would have hair like that has got to be out of his ever-loving mind. There's nothing valuable in you. There's, you're stupid and trashy. Now, folks, you say, why are you saying this to this poor man? I mean it everywhere. No, I don't. I just, just, here's the deal. We have heard people talk to us that way. What gives me the right to say that to him? I don't have a right to say that. I've given myself the right because I am God. Or think I am. Okay? For me to use that kind of slander, I didn't use any cuss words that you did. Notice that? See? That was very good. Okay? I just started demeaning him. It was still terrible. But here's the deal. Every single one of those words are damaging and hurtful unless he knows who he is. He knows who he is. If, if he knows, fire your best. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Call me everything you want to under the face of the sun, but not an ounce of it has any weight when I know who I am. Amen. Amen. Now, just think back at how many times people have said stuff against you called you names, said stupid stuff, you're not worthwhile, you're bad news, you're junk and crud, you're whatever, all this sort of stuff, and you sat there and received it. Brilliant. Why did you receive it? Why did you even start to take any of this stuff that somebody's throwing at you? And one of the biggest things that I tell people on a regular and continual basis is, well, what did Jesus say? He called me stupid. Well, what did Jesus say? Does Jesus think you're stupid? Well, I don't know. Oh, so you didn't ask him. Huh, interesting. So the one who created you is the one that you're not asking what he made. You're letting others who didn't create you out of their pain and damage tell you who you are away from what Christ has said. Now, here's when it gets bad. It gets really bad when you're saying that to a kid mm -hmm. yeah. five years old who cannot defend themselves and they don't know who they are they're just a blank slate to be written on and all you're sitting here just slamming all this stuff to them and they're doing what? They're believing you. They're believing you. Now, that has happened to almost everybody in this room. This is what we've heard. We've heard people say stuff about us, bad stuff bad, just junky crud stuff. They've said stuff to us. We took it. Took it to heart and believed it. It was a lie from the pit of hell that had no basis on anything. Now, what are we talking about now? Okay, now we're looking at this going, wait a minute. How come I feel this disparity between what others have told me you know, and what you're saying Jesus says about me? Because 
Now we have the capacity of walking into that l memory and listening to what somebody says, but we're taking Jesus with us in that memory and we're sitting there watching how somebody says this and it occurs to us. We don't even have to hear it exactly from Jesus. We just sit there and look at it and go, uh, that's dumb. As long as you're in Jesus' presence, hey, yeah, why would... What, why would they say that? And I have found a majority, a lot of people sit there and they go back in their past and they're seeing their mom say this vile stuff or their dad saying this vile stuff or Uncle Henry, whatever, saying all this stuff at them. And they sit there and when they're listening and Jesus is present, they suddenly find themselves not defending themselves, but instead feeling sorry for their mom. Understanding that what were they talking about? Their mom was talking out of her pain. She was talking out of her lies. She was giving stuff out of what she didn't know. Same with your dad, if that's the one that was saying all this stuff. Whatever, whoever it was. It doesn't take much. You can be doing great with mom and dad and just go into a sports thing and have a coach that's stupid. I had to say something, and boy, all of a sudden, you don't want to do sports anymore, you don't want to do anything, and you could be totally talented. Why do we listen? Because we don't know not to. So because we didn't know not to back then, now we can do what? Hey, we can stop this thing. Now we can go back in those memories with Jesus Christ and sit there and listen to what Jesus has to say about it. We can change this whole thing. Why? Because who really knows? Jesus, why? Because I want to know even as I was fully known. I got nobody that knows me Nobody. My parents didn't know me as well as Jesus does. My mom and dad were just George and Merle, and they had their issues to deal with. One of their issues was their son, Lee. <laughs> Everybody knows this. It's all good. But the things that were said, the things that Carol said, the things that Gene said, the things that were said to me in a, in a kid, the things that, that people would say to me, whatever, okay? Why did I give them authority to speak that? Because I was taught to listen to everybody who is in authority and listen to every adult and let them speak into my life. I was taught that. And so all of a sudden, instead of weighing what was right and what was not and being stuck up for by mom and dad or somebody who was doing stuff or whatever, Instead of dealing with those things back then in Christ, what do I have? Now I have to go back and do it again and deal with those things in Christ. Why? Because the revelation knowledge I'm trying to get across to everybody is that you are not just known, you're epi-known. You are known to the finite. He knows if you pick your nose. Bust it again. <laughs> he knows when you're not feeling well. He knows when you're angry. He knows when you're upset. He knows everything about it. He knows when you have gas. Everybody says, yeah, everybody knows that because... <laughs> no, that's not necessarily true. But you, you say, well, that's, that was gross. So you didn't have to bring that. No, no, it does. Because I want you to understand that even the base things, the normal everything in life, Jesus is totally aware of. When you do something embarrassing, then what? You feel bad. People say stuff against you, et cetera, et cetera, and you go downhill. What does Jesus say? See, I'm, I'm really hammering on this because this is the thing that I got clear from the beginning. I'm sitting there going, we have a need to be known, and yet we have a perfect relationship to the one who knows us the most. And we've ignored him. Why are we not free of our past? Because we're still milking it. Or we don't believe that Jesus can do anything about it. One or t'other. I will fully know even as I also was fully known. Okay, I'm going to look back at this thing and go, huh, he knew it all. He knew where I stashed my porn. He knew when I looked at it. 
He knew what I did. He knew every thought that was running through my mind and all the things that were, were there that was bad. He saw, he knew, felt, and understood the violence that was in my heart. He knew it. Now, here's the big part. What chapter is this? The love chapter. He not only epigonoscoed me, he loved me in the middle of his epigonoscoing. He loved me even in his knowing of all that I was bad. No matter how bad, he still loved me. You want to know the worst part about this? Is I didn't have any revelation of how much he loved me. The one most brilliant, strongest thing on the whole planet is the love of God, and that was the one thing I was blocking out. I didn't know he loved me. Didn't know it. I knew for sure out of my twisted thinking that God hated me and God was going to blast me because anybody that does what I had been doing was worthy of judgment. Everybody. I knew that. We preached it. We were, that was it, man. All those vile, wretched sinners. You heard every Sunday morning about how God's going to destroy them and take them down. And yet I'm sitting in the third row sitting there going, that's me. I'm the vile, wretched sinner. And nobody knows. And everybody thinks, oh, look at this poor, this, this kid is, boy, he's going on with Jesus. This is going to be good. I had no idea what was going on inside me. Folks, who are you? Who are you? If you are still beating yourself about being unworthy, stop it! Just stop it! Why? Because it's not about you doing something to make yourself worthy. It's about Jesus Christ has already paid the price to make you worthy, and there is nothing you can do about your sin, and he did it about all of your sin. Amen. Are you worthy? Yes, you are worthy. But I did this. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. I know you did. I did worse. So what? I'm made worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't have anything to bring to this thing. I got nothing to come in and say, oh God, you have to save me because I am wonderful. <laughs> Man, if we don't come with that absolute understanding that we are bad news, junk, and crud that is totally, oh, totally viable to go to hell, if we don't have that in our hearts to come in, wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. I'm coming not because I can be better, but because he's made me awesome. Amen. Okay? Let's get rid of the religion. No religion in this thing. It's all by grace. For by grace you are saved through faith. <coughs> not, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not of those kind. Who are we? Man, we are the ones. We are so blessed. Are you blessed? Amen. Until I match the epigenosis he has of me, I'm not done. So you sit there, go ahead, speak all sorts of vile manner of junk towards my direction, but understand that everything you say, you're going to be held accountable before the God who does love me, and you're going to be held for every idle word. You want to slam me? You want to cuss me out? Really? All that tells me is, I pity you for your ignorance. You have no clue what you're playing with. The God of the universe who loves me so much, he gave up Jesus for me. You're going to slam me? You might as well be cussing at Jesus. You're saying the exact same thing. One of the greatest revelations is who I really am. Who am I? <laughs> I'm more than you need to be cussing at, talking down to. I think it's kind of fascinating. I can walk in a room and everybody can be all sorts of... I just sit there, it's, I smile, I snicker, because if you only knew, my presence is helping you. <laughs> my presence is here as a gift. That's not a pride thing. God is in me. He sent me in the room to bring light, to bring love, to bring change. You want to slam what I'm doing? Really? You want to mess with the gift that God has given? 
It has nothing to do with pride on my part. What is it? Usability. I want to walk in the room as a changing factor to bring the power of Jesus in. Not be changed by people. <clears throat> what has he done for me? Whoa. Hmm. Why do I listen to others? Verse 13 is really cool. I threw it up there anyway because it says, And now faith, hope, and love, these three remain, but the greatest of these is love. Right after all this that he said, we have all this beauty of everything. He says, now, wait a minute. Don't forget what love is all about. The whole chapter ahead of that, what he's given, that's what he's focusing towards you. Why? Because he has epigenosis of you. I want to know you. Oh, Lord, I want to know you. Why do I want to know him? Because I don't know him. I don't know him the way I need to. I don't have revelation knowledge of him the way I need to. But the more revelation knowledge I have of him, the more I understand his love. Because God is love. And when the more I understand his love, then the more I understand I am loved. That's going to change everything, isn't it? Why are you going through the misery you're going through right now? See, it doesn't matter what your situation is. Okay, we just make up something. Maybe you're having a bad time at your job. Okay, that's always a good one to bring up. Bad news stuff at work. Hey, that's been one of the biggest troublemakers in my life is what happens at work. Okay, why am I going through the misery of what's happening at work? Wrong focus. Wrong focus. If the focus is about you, you're already wrong. Why are you in that job? Oh, for you to find victory in that job. Maybe God has a much better job for you, but he can't get it to you until you learn what you need to learn in this one. Why are you in that job? You're in there to learn. And do what? Become an overcomer. To overcome in this situation so that God can work. Bad marriage? Okay. Why are you in it? Well, you're in it till the day you die. So I'm not going to say you're going to, God's going to give you another marriage is better if you just work on this one for a while. <laughs> but he can transform this one. Yes. And it all depends on how you respond. Yeah. That's true, isn't it? What does God want us to do? Learn that he's good for it. Learn that he's in this. He's right here. He's right now. Uh, to learn how he's in it. Who is he? Learn to walk with him better. So when you talk to your husband, what are you doing? You're talking what Jesus has to say to him. You've laid down your soul. You've picked up the soul of the Father for him. And so when you walk up to him, you're perfectly representing Christ. Ooh. Most people don't like that. So when you're talking to your wife, you are perfectly responding to her out of the love that Jesus has. It's no longer trying to put her down, trying to make her obey, trying to, none of that stuff happens because love transforms. Love transforms things. Do we know he loves us? No. Even though we've had the message of that forever. Jesus loves me. This I know. Do I? This I gnosko, need epigonosco. <laughs> For the Bible tells me so, but I need to have a relationship with him until he tells me so. Little ones to him belong like me. I am weak. But he is strong. Amen. Gotta know it's the love of God. If he loves me, and he does. Watch this. This is too fun. Now by faith, hope, and love, these three remain, stay. But the greatest of these is love. I find out if he loves me and he does, then I can trust him. That's called faith. Now, here's kind of a big problem. I get this with a lot of people who come in, husbands who've been dealing with porn or sexual something stupid, and their wives don't trust him anymore. They don't trust them anymore. Yeah, I wonder why. They completely destroyed the trust. Okay? And the husband's trying to get out of this stuff, trying to get out of it, and this wo woman is just continually holding the sin over his head. Okay? I have to talk to the wives. 
and say, you have to forgive. And when I say forgive, I mean absolutely and totally forgive as if it had never happened. She says, you expect me to trust him? Absolutely. The women go, no, I ain't trusting him. He's going to do this. He's going to hurt me again. What, what's the subject matter? It's all about me. If you can't go to Jesus and get healed for it, then you'll never trust anybody ever again. He said, well, she's supposed to trust him? Mm-hmm. To a degree, not making sure he's in a position where he can sin again, taking care of this stuff, working with him on this sort of stuff. But yes, trust has got to come eventually. Why? Because until the trust comes, you don't love him. Because when I can love somebody, I have a future. I have faith. I can trust. Now, if that husband keeps hurting him, keeps hurting him, Okay, fine. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus to take care of it. I have to continually forgive them. Okay, they're going to keep messing up? Oh, probably. They're human. I have not met a husband yet that hasn't messed up again. Maybe not in the same area, but they're human. They make mistakes. Should this woman trust him? Yeah. To how much? To the extent that Jesus is working with them. How much do you love him? There is a correlation between love and trust. Cursed is the man who trusts in flesh and makes flesh his strength and turns away his heart from Jehovah. What did he do? He turned his heart away from Jehovah. He trusts in himself. He's not trusting in God. He doesn't know this love relationship. Further, there's no trust relationship. Come on, go ahead and try to show me anywhere where you can separate trust and, faith and love. No, when I love, I trust. Can I give trust? Yes, because I can give love. You see, it's this fine line, isn't it? We've just made this to such a point. No, don't trust them until they can straighten it out. Wait a minute. They're not going to straighten it out until you trust them. They're not going to straighten it out until you love them. They're not going to straighten it until the, the things of Jesus are the things that's really manifesting here. We've got to bring Jesus into all of this, don't we? But if I know he loves me, then I can trust him. Now, I found out that there are areas in my life. I knew he loved me when I taught the Bible. I knew he loved me when I studied. I didn't know he loved me in my money. My finances, I did not believe that God loved me in my finances. Can I trust him in my finances? Not if I don't think he loves me. I had to get revelation of the fact that he loves me in my finances then I can trust him in my finances. Did that speak to anybody in the room? Is there an area in your life where you're not trusting him? That's the area where you don't believe he loves you. And then I know I have a future. When I trust him, I know I have a future. What's that called? Hope. Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest is his love because that's what bases everything else on. When I know he loves me, I can trust him. When I know I can trust him, I have a future. I heard, read a commentary. <laughs> Some of these commentaries tickle me. Like that. The guy says, well, the reason the greatest of these is love, okay, is because it's the only one that is a quality of God. What? I went, excuse me? What? I thought it says in there that he's the God of hope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of killed that whole thing. You know? <laughs> it's all based on what he has done and what he will do. Everything we have is based on what? Jesus. Jesus, what he's doing, or the Father, Holy Spirit, what God is doing in our lives. Okay? My focus will have to be on him. That's all there is to it. This is going to be quick. I'm going to jump into 2 Timothy very quickly. Chapter 2, 19 through 21. I just needed, this is just too cool. I just wanted to show this to you. However, the foundation of God stands firm having this seal. The Lord knew the ones being his. The foundation of this seal is what? The Lord knows those who are his. Are you his? Then he knows you. And he knows you're his. Has he lost ownership of you? At any point, can you just see the father stand up off the throne and say, anybody seen Kathleen? She was here a minute ago. I just had her. Oh, come on, Where'd she, what is with that girl? <laughs> God has never lost track of Kathleen. Amen. 
which is a constant source of relief to Nathaniel. <laughs> okay. But there are people here, not everybody here has a relationship where they know that God is dealing with their spouse right. Has God lost control? Has God can't find your spouse anywhere? He knows. God has not lost track, folks. Can we trust him? Well, if you can't trust him for your spouse, that means what? God doesn't love you in your marriage. Okay. The Lord knows the, knew the ones being his. Also, let everyone naming the name of Christ depart from unrighteousness. Maybe we should put that on the wall somewhere. Amen. Let everyone naming the name of Christ depart from unrighteousness. But in a great house, not only are there vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. And if anyone purifies himself from this, before I go on any further, in every house there's a vessel of honor and vessels of dishonor. If you ask people which one they are, they will, in their state of pseudo-humility, tell you that they're a vessel of dishonor. Oh, I'm just, just a poor little pot. Knock it off. Knock it off. I'm just, I'm just a, oh, I'm just a bedpan in the kingdom of God. Yeah, I went there, didn't I? But see, that's what I feel when I get people in their false humility saying, oh, I'm just bad. I'm just unworthy. I'm just lowly. Knock it off. Because in every house, there are those vessels, but then it says this, then, if anyone purifies himself from these, he will be a vessel of honor having been sanctified and made useful to the master, having been prepared to every good work. I want you to get your attitude up there to where you understand how much does he love you. Okay? My wife has been complaining about this skillet she has. It has not been doing what it's supposed to do. The skillet is going out the back door. That's already in the dumpster. Gone. Was that a vessel of honor? For a while, it cooked really well. Then it quit cooking. It used up its usefulness. Okay, mighty Christian. You haven't used up your usefulness yet. Most of you haven't even taken off the packaging time to be used what makes it a vessel of honor and a vessel of dishonor on what the master of the house uses it for if he can't get you to do anything valuable then you're not a vessel of honor folks you're better than that you are high you are okay here's the way I put this our attitude comes from our supposed knowledge okay when we have a bad view of ourselves we see ourselves less than who we really are you're more than that. We think we are vessels of dishonorable use, but we can become vessels of honor. In fact, the ones that the housemaster shows off. Now, we used to have in our house two sets of dishes. The everyday and the desert rose. Okay? We had this nice set. My wife one day says, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. When we bring out the good plates for others and the bad plates for us, then our attitude is we are not worthy. So she, we have one set of dishes. It's what we use. It's for us. Why? Because we are the good china. You are the good stuff. You are the good stuff. Every time you slam yourself like that, you take yourself away from being able to be used of God in an honorable way. And I'm, I'm done with that. I want, I want to understand. We're set aside for his use only. He'll use us, not according to my past, but according to his love. Yes. According to his plan. According to his plan. I love this. We still don't get how big grace is. Uh -huh. Still don't get it. For by grace you're saved. Man, we just aren't, aren't getting it. He knows you. 
and he loves you. Who are you? You need epigenosis of who you really are. You are no longer a child. Grow up. Act like it. Be who God has called you to be. You are mature in him. That's the plan. That's where we're heading. You are able to receive epigenosis. You're able to receive revelation knowledge. So we're able to come what he says you are. Not what you say you are, or not what your mom and dad said you are, or Uncle Henry, or that kid on the playground, or that coach that hated you, or whatever. No. Or your co-workers, your boss. Okay? All those different people that we've used. Okay? Man, who are you? Deal with your past, come to terms with it, and let it be past. Deal with your past. Come to terms with it. Let it be past. Who are you now? The redeemed. <laughs> See, you started it. Now you got me talking about redemption. See? Okay. Present and future you are extremely valuable. Extremely valuable. This is your testimony. Have I done wrong? Yes! Has he done right? What did Jesus do? Washed it. Who am I now? Unique. Set aside. Amen to, that. Amen. Amen to that. Okay? So, lift up your heads from out of your past. <laughs> lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. Who are you? A vessel of honor. Lift up your heads. See who you really are in your present. Who you are right now. Because you are children of the Most High God. Amen. You are more than you've ever given yourself credit to be. And how then should we respond? Now, was that worthwhile to wait on and to get there? Epigenosis of who you are. Are you blessed? Yes. Who are you? More than you've ever given yourself credit to be. Amen. You're better. You're better. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. You are the mighty God we serve and we love you. Lord, may this speak to each heart that we are more more than we've ever given ourselves credit to be. That the false humility has kept us down, kept us from becoming who you've called us to be. We are your children. Blessed of you, called of you, set in place to be more than you've ever, than more than we've ever seen. More than we've ever let you become in us. And Lord, for that we will give you praise. You are awesome. Be with us, touch us. Change us as we grow. And we will give you the glory, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.